day for our virtual meetup. Um, and, and meetups always have interesting stories behind them, um, whether they're the technical part of it, but um, but also the um, the stories just getting here in the first place. Um, uh, Petio Ivanov from um, Glue 42 is going to talk about how uh, Glue 42 has been taking a, a journey uh, from closed source to open source. Um, and I'm just going to let Petio go ahead and go. Uh, we're already quarter past the hour. Petio, please take it over. Yeah, thank you very much for the intro, Gris. Everyone, uh, my name is Petio Ivanov. I'm the product manager of Glue 42. And today I'm going to talk about the journey of our company into the open source world. Uh, I will explain the new initiative we are currently running. Uh, it has just been released, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I will explain what's our motivation behind it, uh, why we are starting it, and what do we hope to make out of it, and what to give to, uh, to the people who are using it. Um, so, spoiler alert, we are in the beginning of our journey, so I do hope that Finos will invite us a couple of months from now so we can share an update with everyone about how are we going. Um, so, to start with uh, a short intro about what Go42 is, uh, well, the way I would put it, we are the textbook definition of uh, an enterprise uh, software vendor. Usually large organizations with complex software development life cycles are choosing Glue 42 as a way for them to integrate in-house uh, development software and things which they have purchased into a single unified user workflow. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, FDC3, Glue 42 is one of the supporting platforms for FDC3. Meet Glue 42 core, uh, and this is uh, a new initiative. And uh, comparing it with Glue 42, which is, uh, of course, a commercial product uh, with uh, complex licensing mechanism and so on and so on, Glue 42 core is uh, probably the exact opposite of that. And that's a new version of, of our product. So, Glue 42 core is uh, open source, it's MIT licensed, which means that anybody can take the package, install it in their environment, go to production with it, without even bothering to contact us. Uh, exactly the opposite of uh, how you would obtain Glue 42, right? It's free of charge and so on and so on. Now, uh, that's a pretty sharp turn, uh, as you may understand. Uh, so let's explain what made us do that. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in Glue 42 core, I'm going to share some resources by the end of this presentation. So what we, before I move forward, uh, I would like to present a probably informal and not very complete model of why companies like ours uh, are, um, and not only ours, but companies in general are uh, open sourcing things either products or internal bits and so on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about personal open source projects because uh, eventually as they evolve, they uh, either die out or they just transform into companies or they just uh, enter a foundation of some sort, but let's focus on company sponsored open source products. So um, the first one, which you might be familiar with is when a company decides to open source a byproduct of uh, their main one. And the example I have chosen here is a company called Basecamp. Back in the days, they were called 37 Signals, which 15 years ago open sourced uh, a framework called Ruby on Rails. And you might be familiar with that actually. So Ruby on Rails was uh, something which they internally used to build their software as a service platform called Basecamp. And uh, one beautiful day, they decided to make it open source, MIT licensed, as far as I remember, for other companies to use it. So what happened was that the product was amazing and uh, similar companies to them flocked in and uh, started basing their own SaaS solutions on top of that. Within this process, they also contributed back to the platform, in which case the benefit of 37 signals slash base camp was that 
bright individuals uh, contributed back to the core of uh, to the underlying uh, framework of their own product so they they got uh, effectively a lot of talent and great ideas back for free uh, second case uh, and this is usually executed by tech giants like facebook google and microsoft is when you are releasing uh, an open source product as a talent attractor as means uh, to influence the general direction of a um, of certain ecosystem, of a certain space, and also to build a reputation of your company amongst tech circles. The examples I have chosen here are Facebook open sourcing React, Google open sourcing Angular, Microsoft, and their awesome TypeScript. I'm sure that uh, the people here have some of those technologies, if not all of them employed in the internal organization. So um, don't get me wrong, uh, every open source project out there, a successful one, will uh, somehow serve as a talent attractor and uh, as a reputation builder for the company. But my belief is that uh, those in particular were specifically um, done for the purpose of uh, you know, building a reputation for the company and attracting good talent. Third one, and uh, I'm not going to name companies here uh, because if I had to, I would probably name a company which I previously worked for, is, uh, is a model which I don't really recommend because it's hard to execute and uh, more often than not unsuccessful, is when you open source uh, stripped down and uh, in many cases, this functional version of your main commercial product with uh, the primary purpose of, you know, people trying it out and eventually upgrading to your uh, paid commercial version. And uh, again, this is really hard to execute because uh, you have mixed incentives here. You are, your main incentive is people to upgrade. So sometimes you go overboard with the restrictions and the functionalities which you strip from what you have open sourced and uh, eventually it turns into some form of a nagware where you know people are not really happy with it and um, it, it it makes a bad service to the companies who did this and this is actually my first experience when uh, we open sourced a commercial product so not recommending that in general for and um, I am calling it the Red Hat model. Uh, now that we are part of the Linux Foundation, this is even even great. Where um, essentially you have a, you have a very useful and usable product uh, being the core of someone's business, and this this core product, uh, the Linux kernel, and uh, in fact the entire Red Hat um, operating system is uh, available for everybody to use. Uh, there are no restrictions applied on top of that. Uh, in this case, the companies who are doing this are making money out of um, additional premium services on, on top of it. For example, like uh, commercial support, uh, premium features, upgrades, uh, and so on and so on. Now, as you may guess by the name I have put uh, even within this circle, this is the model which we will try to achieve with Go42 Core. That's why we actually chose chose the name of that. And by the way, Go42 Core shares uh, its core with our commercial version of the product. So um, we consider this to be a great fit for what um, for what Go42 is as a product because we are actually integrating uh, multiple applications, some of them being internal, some of them coming from vendors. So the fact that anybody can take uh, the, this platform and uh, they can integrate it within their uh, environments uh, or just uh, you know make it an optional adding for their commercial product of some sort makes perfect sense because those people should uh, be free to do that within uh, on their own terms without going through some hoops and so on and so on. So. Um, Again, this kind of a Red Hat model also suggests that multiple entities can uh, make profit on top of a common core uh, by providing different kinds of services uh, or even competing with themselves while at the same time contributing to the same core. And um, 
main point here is that as long as this ecosystem is viable, uh, such kind of a competition around the common core makes sense because uh, the more value uh, it's created within those circles, the more there is for everybody, right? So that's what we are going to try and execute with U42 core. Now, the important bit here uh, related to this diagram I have drawn is for this model to be viable and to attract other people, we obviously need uh, an entity like the Finos Foundation. So our long-term plans and uh, medium-term plans are to see if we can actually talk with Finos and see if there is a way for Glue 42 core itself to become part of Finos. Uh, will this happen? Well, not immediately. We would like to get some feedback while it's still on our own, but yeah, that's that's a possibility which we are quite open to, to be honest. Uh, so the next thing which uh, is quite important uh, is uh, the relationship between Glue 42 core and another uh, project within Finos, uh, FDC3, which I mentioned previously. And I believe that those two have uh, a lot of synergy between uh, them. First of all, Glue 42 core is going to support FDC3. This is in our short-term priorities. Um, and uh, we believe that this will be very beneficial for the standard because Glue 42 core is uh, entirely free for anybody to try on their site. And uh, in fact, they can distribute FDC3 applications without uh, the usual install mechanisms which are currently used for other FDC3 implementations. So we hope that the fact that Glue 42 core is open and free for everybody will benefit FDC3. Uh, and uh, the other way around is also true. Uh, in order for Glue 42 core to be attractive to uh, other vendors and for people who would like to try it out, we don't want to make this uh, vendor specific implementation. Uh, and the fact that you will be able to use FDC3 implementation within this environment is also a mechanism for us to say, well, this is an environment which, which is truly open. So, yeah, that's um, that's something which is really, really important for us, the integration with FDC3. So, next chapter of my presentation is going to uh, focus on the benefits and challenges we have seen so far uh, within our journey of making Glue 42 Core an open source project. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, from technical product, me being a product manager and organizational perspective. Uh, so number one, and that's uh, a challenge, uh, organizational challenge is that the business people within this organization are saying, well, when we go open source, competitors are going to use and steal our code. Um, again, uh, let's hope that the code is good enough for everybody to consider stealing it. But uh, my response to that is that, well, uh, code this is an important asset. To a certain extent, it's a liability as well. But um, the greatest asset is, uh, is not only the code, but uh, the business behind it, the connections we have, the reputations we have built, uh, the relationships, the communication channels, uh, our organizational capacity, executions, and so on. Also, the people behind the code are the really important ones, right? So, um, I must say that just taking a snapshot of the code base and going uh, somewhere and trying to do something with it is it's not going to work that easy. You need significant investment to take something like a mature and complex product, understand its code base, and uh, make a business around it. And if you're going to do that, by the end of the day, you can actually contribute to the common core. There is no need to try something like this. And the final thing here is that if your competitors are going to rely on, on, on your source code for their business, then you will always be several steps ahead of them, right? Number two. Uh, we can no longer rely on security through obscurity because uh, the code is there, everybody can review it and uh, can spot any potential problems which are present in it. Uh, this is not very applicable for the product we have, but it's in general applicable to open source project. Again, I believe that this is also a benefit because uh, this is the ultimate proof that your product really 
is secure enough so that even if the source code is out there available for everybody to check and uh, verify, um, it, there are no visible problems with it. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's in, in my book uh, the ultimate proof that uh, your product is secure. Of, of course, it has to be really secure for, for that. Right. So um, next, this is a pure benefit. Uh, the tool chain which is available for open source project is projects is the best. Let's thank Microsoft for that. Uh, but really, what's what's available right now in terms of GitHub projects, previously we had Travis, which is a CI tool which lets you build your, and release your software and compile it for free. All those things are really available for free for open source projects. There are good reasons for that. Microsoft knows that open source is fueling the software industry, so they are getting a lot of benefit from, from that. Um, so yeah, the more you give, the more you will receive. Uh, for Bit is dev to dev straight communication channel. Um, that's a benefit and a challenge because previously developers from different organizations had to pass through multiple hoops in order to obtain information or just get somebody to help them. Right now, with an open source project like that, you have a direct channel available through standard tools, which are part of GitHub, like issues. Everybody knows how this works. So anybody can open an issue and just ask their question. And on the other side, you will get uh, likely a response from the developer, right? So um, that's also a challenge, I guess, because uh, developers in your organization might not be used to being uh, in this client-facing role, which is actually uh, the fifth point, which I have here. Engineers are now on the front, on the front line. They're your representatives. So I think that this is mostly a benefit because bringing more business context and more actual understanding of what's going on on the other side of the product is uh, is good for them. Engineers are smart people. They will understand what, what's going on there and incorporate those uh, challenges straight into their, um, into their code base. So the more they understand uh, and the more they are connected to the client, the better. Uh, again, some organizations and we may end up there as well, might need uh, dedicated uh, community managers or support people who are just sifting through issues and so on and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are not there yet. We have our developers answering the issues themselves. Six point, point six, the one which I mentioned previously, um, open source projects are great talent attractors. People are there to see how awesome your company is the processes are out there for them to see you can even have people uh you know participating in your project for a while on their own terms uh and they can decide if they want to work with you so you can gradually onboard them and so on and so on speaking of which point seven uh, running an open source project at least uh, if it's run properly and not just uh, as a dump of the source code in, inside the public repository uh, is uh, a remote and uh, global process by default, right? Because uh, essentially if you are, um, how to say, facilitating for uh, external contributors, this means that all of your processes, uh, all of your project management systems, so all, all, all of your issues, uh, roadmaps, everything should be out there, the process should, the process should be explicit and most of the time it should be also asynchronous so that people can actually participate in that. Um, and uh, again, this means that you are free to dip into the global talent pool. You can bring awesome people from all over the world. Again, um, in the perfect world and in the best run open source project, uh, people should be able to self on board without uh, any assistance on your side within this project. They should be able to figure out what's it for, how it's usable, and also how they can contribute back to it, which is like uh, the ultimate experience uh, compared to the usual things where you have to have somebody on board you uh, on, on the code base and so on and so on. Number eight, the final point, uh, and this is my, uh, my favorite bit. It's a pure challenge and I'm facing it on a, every day. And I have this awesome quote from the first marketing manager, which was uh, facing our open source initiative. 
the question was, where are my MQLs? So um, MQLs stands for uh, Marketing Qualified Leads. And these are usually fleshed out through a carefully designed process where people go through registrations and so on and so on so that marketing can nurture them properly. Open source projects by default uh, allow everybody to download uh, and install and use the software without any need for authentication. That's what developers uh, are used to and they're not going to bother with uh, a custom design process, which sales and marketing people are used to. Uh, that, that's a pure challenge. Uh, I don't think that it's not possible for it to overcome somehow. Um, by the end of the day, if people are genuinely interested in your project and uh, they are going to contact you and uh, you will figure some way for, for them to actually get in touch with you and probably if they're interested in the product and your well-designed premium services, they will uh, decide to buy them eventually. Now, the summary which I would like to give from the lessons I have shared so far, we are in the beginning of our journey, uh, but uh, building an open source project definitely looks easier from outside uh, than from the inside especially because uh, many companies, successful ones, make it look so easy because, uh, yeah, they are just contributing the source code, everybody's just chatting around, everybody's just great in their communication and so on and so on. So if you look from the outside, it looks really easy, but it's, it's not that easy, especially if you have not done it before. But um, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing process and uh, the key uh, thing here is that a presence of a foundation like um, like the Finos one is really important because we can use it uh, uh, to share lessons between each other. We can also ask experienced people uh, to get advices on licensing mechanisms on, on the way we are actually open sourcing the project, uh, all the steps uh, necessary to do that. For example, Wu42 Core is based on one of the templates prepared by Finos which was a really, really good one. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, it's great that we have somebody helping us in, in this journey. And the final thing is that regarding, regardless of um, the reasons behind open sourcing the project, uh, ultimately your team, your engineering team, your sales, marketing and product teams will come out better out of it uh, because you, you will learn many lessons about your processes. Uh, you will try new things. You will get better communication channels. You will connect to customers which you never previously could uh, reach out for. So yeah, it's, it's worth trying uh, um, from my perspective. And I really hope that we will make it better. And um, we will be back, I hope, few months from now, sharing more war stories. Uh, again, uh, being a Finos meetup, I do want to ask you about uh, how are we going? I'm going to write down a list of uh, expectations and rules that you want. Where you were. Did I hear that? Somebody unmuted themselves. So, um, yeah. So this is the repository we have. Uh, and, uh, I think that uh, Chris can share the links in the chat so you don't have to read rekey those. So this is the repository of our project. It's in github.com. Glu42 is the organization. The repository is core. We also have uh, a website, small website, which describes the purposes of the product uh, we have. Uh, and uh, a third link is from a webinar we did one week ago, which was the release webinar. So you can take a look at it as well. I'm really interested in the feedback, uh, not only on the product itself, but on the way we have packaged it, on the clarity of our documentation, on on the things which are out there for you to interact with without actually be us being present and guiding you through the product, which is, from my perspective, the most important trait of an open source project. People should be able to onboard themselves uh, on their own terms. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Do we have any questions, Chris, available in the chat? No, not yet. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself if you need to. And I know, Tasha, are you in? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Oh, hello. hello. Hi, back. <laughs> Hi. I've been listening. 
it's been excellent. Thank you. I, I, uh, any any questions before we wrap up? Wrap up. And I appreciate that we're running a little long. And, and I do apologize for um, my machine and my headphones and my phone, the lot, and San Francisco's Wi-Fi. All right. And, uh, and Tasha, we do. I did post in chat um, the T-shirt winners. Just excellent. So. Um, all right, so if there are no questions, then then we'll wrap up. I thank you everyone uh, again for coming and joining us. And Ben Petio, thank you. Um, you know, we obviously love uh, anything open source that, that is for financial services. So, you know, very exciting news for uh, for you, for us, for the industry. Um, we will just just so everyone knows, and I, I'm sure Chris already covered this, but we will post the slides and the video uh, on LinkedIn. So please do carry on the conversation there. And as Grizz mentioned, we've done the random draw for t-shirts in an effort to make this as uh, much meetup like as possible with technical issues and all. Um, and the winners today are Danielle Almeida from Itzau and Ashley Nell Davis from Data Coalition. So uh, Grizz will get in touch to make sure that he has your details so that we can send those to you. Um, Again, thank you all for coming. And for those of you new to Finos, or if you're not already involved and want to get more involved, uh, do feel free to reach out to us at info at finos.org if you have any questions. Um, and also, uh, you know, obviously, please check out the links uh, for Glue42 uh, and see how you can uh, get involved there too. And uh, so, I've just posted, I've just posted the uh, slides in LinkedIn under um, Finos. Um, uh, Petio and Blue42 are also tagged in that, but um, but again, those uh, are under our account, Finos, um, right. in LinkedIn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Have everybody. a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.